Hey, Brain. <laughs> uh, welcome. It's uh, hey, it's Brandon. How are you, sir? How's it going, man? I'm doing well. I'm here in uh, New York City. We were just recording. We were learning about our, our fan co-host, and I appreciate you you allowing that to happen. Oh, we're talking to Connie from Greece. Hello. Hi, hey, Brain. Hi, on. How's it going, man? Fine. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Good. Just, uh, yeah, hanging out. Where are you calling cool. from? Uh, I'm actually calling from the Bay Area because I had a uh, my first USTA tennis match last night. Whoa. <laughs> What? That's uh, that's too that's too specific for you to be joking. So that actually you had you had a, an official tennis match last night. Yeah, yeah. You know, I um, it's a long story, and maybe we'll talk about it because it's part about what I'm doing now. But um, yeah, you know, I did you play the- against Lars? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't no. My goal, and I'm putting it out there now, is actually I I, I think he's pretty fucking good though. So I don't. I think I, need, he you know, I I mean, I played a little bit in high school, but um, I've been playing now pretty seriously for about two years, taking Lennit lessons and shit. Wow. And uh, my goal is to get up there. I don't know what he's ranked, you know, so I got to, I got to figure that out. Like I got to like look it up or find out. But once I get up to his ranking, yeah, I definitely want to challenge him because I've been practicing. <laughs> so I had my first match with a, a an official USTA team last night. So, yeah. So, wow. I'm in the Bay right now. And then um, I got some other shit I got to do here. So, anyways. How, yeah. How'd you do? That's This is so cool. Uh, I won. <laughs> yeah. So, they were impressed. They were like, wow. Usually people have to, uh, you know, do like um, two or three matches before they get into it. But, um, yeah, I, I've been practicing. So, you know, I felt pretty good out there. Wow, good for you. Yeah, no, I, I do want to get more into that. But uh, as we, as I mean, I don't know if you remember because it's been a while since we've spoken. I, I just really appreciate you, you coming back on because um, we spoke back in episode forty-two. I don't know what that means to you, but since I do it, kind of in perspective, almost once a week, I'm out. I'm up to one ten now. Yeah, and I noticed that. Yeah, it's just been great. I mean, you were one of my early, uh, I think, like really big guests. And people still are talking about you all the time. Just like what a great episode that was. And people who've listened multiple times, including Connie here, who listened three times uh, to, yeah, right. to the uh-huh. interview. <laughs> Didn't I talk for like five hours? Or <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I mean, you know, I felt like shit. Does anybody want to even listen to me again? But, you know, I appreciate you uh, having me on. And, you know, I mean, it's always it's always good to talk, you know, about about stuff. So thanks, man. Yeah, no, it's been, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, you, again, just your time and how personable you were. We were talking off the air, Connie and I, of, I, during that interview, we were like, am I talking too much? And we were like, no, we, we, we love it. I mean, this is what, this is the cool thing now, Brain, with, and because I, I know you're not big, you're not anything with social media unless things have changed. Podcasts are huge. No, my, my, that's my goal, though. This year, I'm getting into some shit. I'll talk about it later. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, yeah, I'm uh, like, I got a team of people working on this shit. So good. It'll be good. Good, 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 good. Yeah, because we got to get you at least on, on Instagram or something. Although Instagram and Facebook had like a, I don't know, a massive attack yesterday that it was down all day. Yeah, I, I heard about that. Like a blackout or something. <laughs> the whole thing went down. I know. People actually had to go outside and do stuff, you know, live life. <laughs> Yeah, throw some dirt clods around and shit. Yeah. Un- unbelievable. So, yeah, I, I mean, we're going to talk about tennis. We're going to talk about, you know, everything that everything else that you have going on now. Uh, we got some fan comments and questions for you. Uh, I do I do want to play you a couple things uh, because, for one, why people appreciated and loved your interview so much is I, I think you gave us – well, are you familiar with, like, you know, Pee Wee Herman, that show, uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse? I had, like, a word of the day at the end. You know, or and at the end, like everyone, whenever it was said, everybody would scream. I don't know. Did you do you watch Pee Wee's Playhouse, or is this a weird uh, comparison? No, I mean, I did a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, I haven't in years, but I kind of remember something like that. You know, I mean, I would just randomly watch it here and there, but I wasn't like an avid fan. Or... All right. Well, there was always like a special word of the day. So, listening to your interview, uh, there was like a certain yeah. word you used a lot, and that, that word. Um... What's that? <laughs> Was it? <laughs> was it um? <laughs> no. <laughs> was it uh? Nope. 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 Um, here, uh... <laughs> here it is. It's rad. It's rad. You would say 
<laughs> rad a lot. It's rad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I got to borrow that, dude. I'm always playing samples. Like when I play gigs and stuff with Bucket, you know, in between the set, I always, I, I'll always play like, you know, like weirdo, you know, Godfather samples or something. Sure. I might have to get that from you. It's oh, a good one. A hundred percent. Yeah. Or you yeah. could just walk up into a bike and speak. Just say it into a microphone? Is that what you were saying, Connie? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't need the sample. You could just yeah. say it into a microphone. Yeah, but then I couldn't say it's my sample. I want to be a part of it. Yeah, okay. Don't take that away yeah, from and me. I like, uh, I like the processing that it went through. Like, it's been sampled a couple times. It's just all weird. <laughs> it kind of has that kind of, like, Howard Stern, you know, it's like, all echoey way in the back type of feel <laughs> and it's not just you I, I guess noticed like the rad thing also and it was in a duff interview he said rad and because i'm, I'm weird uh, it, uh, it reminded me of a certain of the first nature turtles movie when they were all like baby turtles saying rad so i i right. i put this together That's pretty radical. Radical, radical, radical. Uh, see what, <laughs> what those random yeah. sounds that you and bucket play that's what's going on through my head 24 7 all the time it's oh god i need help uh but... dude well I'm, I'm it'll probably be the word again for this interview because i say that that's my word i mean i i grew up kind of in like the silicon valley you know during the skate era sure. of, of um you know right when like stevie caballero was coming up and this guy uh, uh black hawk you know he was you know and they had the um uh, the I forgot what they called like the Los Altos pool. I think it was like the hardest spot to hit, you know, and that kind of stuff. And everybody said, you know, rad was the word and that was it. And it's just, I don't think I ever let it go, you know? So I, I mean, I love it again, there. being a Ninja Turtles guy. Uh, they use radical all the time. And actually since, what was it? It was a bike movie. I'm looking at it now. It was called rad. It came out in 1986. I think it was a, maybe it was a BMX movie. But, yeah, I think you're right. But you were you were more of a skateboarder. Yes, I came from the the skateboarding. I never got really into BMX. I mean, I did a little bit, but I realized um, I just I cultivated toward the skate culture because you know um, they were playing like a lot of old school like you know punk rock and 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 early ACDC. You know, and I just, for some reason, I just cultivated toward that scene where the BMXers, they, you know, they didn't really have that. They never had like a ghetto box on the, you know, on the side cranking music and stuff. And I, you know, that I wasn't even into drums yet. I was skateboard that, you know, I wasn't even a drummer when I heard, you know, early, early Sex Pistols, you know, like early ACDC, all that kind of stuff. You know, I was like man, this shit's rad. And then I, you know, <laughs> tried to start playing the bass and doing all that stuff for, I think bass was my first instrument. I don't know if I talked about this before, so if I'm repeating myself, you can just delete it. Uh, but, no, um, I don't remember. Like, Maybe bass. Connie does. I don't remember. <laughs> so it's new to me. Yeah. yeah no, no, really. Talk about this. Yeah, because it was like, you know, I wanted to play first. First I dabbled, you know, with, you know, string instruments, you know, guitar, bass. And then I was like, ah, shit, this isn't really working. So, um, my friend Merv, who actually I'm doing a project with him now is, um, said, you know, he was at school. Uh, he was like two years younger than me and my sister was in his class and he was like, Oh man, you know, he's got a band and he's playing some ACDC and Led Zeppelin and all that shit. And I was like, Oh shit, that's the stuff I've been hearing, you know, at the skate park and stuff. Shit. I'm going to try to learn some of that shit. And the easiest thing to pick up was the drums, and it kind of just came naturally. You know, I was just kind of like, oh, shit, ACDC, a straight beat. This is cool. I can just, like, rock out going, da, 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 and they play riffs over it. So that's sort of how I kind of got into the whole, you know, like, um, music was through skating hmm. and hanging out at the pools, and people would be playing all this music that I was just like, oh, shit, this is this is – this is rad. This is rad. <laughs> it's rad. Get that example. It's rad. You know what? I, I just came, you know what I was just thinking of? I'm wondering if that kind of how you like the beat, the pacing, translates to tennis. Because in a way, tennis is waiting for a beat. You know? Or am I overthinking it? No, no. I mean, yeah. I mean, you're right. Like, you know, I, you know, what my teachers are 
t- teaching me is is yeah is you know the way that the ball the way the ball I mean to hear the sound of the ball bounce right and where you hit it determines if you're going to hit it early late you're going to you know pick it up or you know like um and, and you know get it on um you know like get it before it comes up or whatever that stuff you listen to where the ball hits and then when the racket hits, so you get into a rhythm. It is all about rhythm. I think that's why I do right. like tennis because when we were golfing on tour and shit, it wasn't the same, you know, it was like, there was, you know, I mean, I guess you can get into the rhythm with a swing, but it's not the same as tennis. You literally, I mean, that's the name of the game is to kind of get that rhythm going. And that's why they say right. when like the pros, like will take a break or, or like, oh shit, I got to go to the bathroom or I got, you know, they try to, if they're losing, they try to break the other person's rhythm by, you know, complaining about something or taking a little more time during serves, that kind of shit, because your rhythm gets off. So I, yeah, you're right, actually. I mean, I think that's why I'm kind of cultivating towards it. And, you know, and plus it's great exercise and stuff. And, oh, for sure. I just want to see yeah. you take over men's tennis. You know, it's been lacking since uh, Pete Sampras. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was just on the uh, the, the open there having at Indian Wells. He was in the uh, like Djokovic was playing in there. He went up and shook his hand because he was in the stands watching because that was his idol. Oh, that's cool. You know, like ten years ago or whatever, or fifteen years ago. But right anyway, on. yeah, right on. Um, something that it's funny, and I, I, Connie, I want you to ask about because one thing would I know we didn't spend a lot of time on uh, last episode was Tom Waits. Uh, so that, one of the reasons why I wanted you know, uh, yeah. Connie to come on and talk about that. But before that, um, mm-hmm. a- again, what made me reach out to you was having Tommy on again. And right, w- I-, I spoke to Tommy about, you know, somebody a- told me to ask him as, you know, listeners, you know, submit questions, ask him to give the other side of Brain's story about when Brain uh, tried out for Guns N' Roses. And-, and I said to Tommy how you were so candid about kind of being underprepared. So, Tommy, Tommy thought that was kind of funny, and I just wanted you to hear his uh, response to that, if you don't mind. You know, he he, he was very uh, he was very candid about <laughs> about being ill prepared. Yeah, we were about to go, and we were about to go on tour at some point soon after, and I had to, I kind of got rid of the rest of the band for probably I might have been like a good week or two, where him and I just hunker down and learn the, learn the songs the way they had to be done and work together. I had to kind of, you know, get him into shape and into gear to do the stuff because you couldn't just, those songs have so many parts and so many dynamics to them. You can't just kind of wing it. You got to learn the goddamn song. And so that's what we had to do. And, and I had to kind of strap him down and, you know, get him to that point. I just thought it was funny how he was just kind of taking, he's like, oh, Brain was so honest about you about that uh, that moment. So I guess, thought, <laughs> but he was so nice and he loves and, and misses you and appreciates you. So uh, I don't know. I guess thought you might get a kick out of hearing his response to that. Oh yeah, no, because that you know, because I know I talked about that in the last one <clears throat> a little bit. But yeah, I mean, it it was pretty bad that first couple of days. I think he was looking at me and was just going like, "Wait, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> really?" You know, like, this is Guns N' Roses, and, dude, you're just going to walk in thinking you can, like, just, you know, like, like this is an improv, you know, like, j- jazz jam or something. You know, he kind of had that look, like, oh, no, this ain't gonna, this ain't going to fly. So that's why I think, you know, I started to learn the songs, and he worked with me, and, you know... And I, I, you know, yeah, I mean, that's pretty funny. That's such a good story. I guess I find it still, you know, or maybe things have changed. Just like, I guess going back to tennis, this might be the theme of today's episode, but how much work you do put into your stuff. I mean, you have like the natural talent to do with stuff, to, 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 whether it's like you said, uh, guitar or if it's a sport, but then you still practice at it. So I guess I'm still kind of just like, wow, for GNR, he just, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, if it was just like a, a moment where you just didn't think you needed to, or I don't know, it was just, I just find it surprising knowing whatever I do know about you. I know I don't know too much, but you, you always see. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I was, well, yeah. I mean, like, there, like for Primus, it was, you know, I looked at it more like jazz, you know, I approached it like jazz 
that because that was my probably the biggest gig I I I I had you know before Guns and Roses you know was like okay I did you know the eight or nine years with Primus and what happens with Primus is it's it's kind of like okay you know this is this is what um, you know Tim played but you know you can interpret it I can I can kind of interpret it the way I would want to do it or whatever so. When I was learning the songs, it was more just song forms. You know, I would just go, oh, eight bars is this part, 16 bars is this part, four bars here, oh, there's a little tag here of two bars. And I would, you know, listen to what Tim played, but I never wrote out the beat and never did, you know, the intricacies of it. Because I think with Primus, maybe even the fans, I don't know. I mean, it's probably, you know, I mean, some fans hated my style and hated my playing. And some fans loved it. But I think that that was kind of a given in Primus, if that makes sense. You know, it was just kind of like, oh, okay, they got this guy now. And they're still playing Tommy the Cat, but this is the way he plays it and does it. And he changes the kick drum pattern a little bit. And, um, you know, I'll go to the ride at a certain section, but, um, you know, I'll do accents a different way. But with guns, it was like, wait a second, you know, these were, pop, the, you know, Appetite was like, a, you know, the biggest album of that time, I guess, or whatever. So it was like, wait, no, this is the way you, you have to play it. If that makes, you know what I mean? It was like... There was no room to be, <laughs> to do yeah, your style. No, 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 I couldn't just put eight bars here. So when my first rehearsal with Tommy, you know, like I think I said it before, you know, I came in with like a Primus kit. You know, I came in with this drum kit. My drum tech brought in, like, three toms up front, two floor toms, uh, two snare drums, I think, some splash cymbals and shit, you know. And I was like, wait. I, I get, You know, and I had some of the forms I knew and had written out, you know, like, or something maybe. You know, I don't, I don't quite remember, but I kind of was like, I kind of know how the song goes. But I think Tommy was just like, you're not, pl you know, this isn't, that's not right or this isn't work you know the sound is weird or whatever so like literally after when we when i w went back for a couple of days and started learning the songs and woodshed it and then came back my drum tech brought the more bottom kit you know it was like a 20 i think i even tried a 26 inch bass drum i didn't end up using that but i think we ended up using the 24 but it was like a 24 uh bass drum 13 tom two floor toms and three symbols, you know, big crashes, like get rid of the splashes, get rid of all the high, this shit doesn't need this shit. You know, like, so I started to kind of realize, oh, and, and, oh, this is the way he played this part. Oh, I see it's orchestrated. Oh, I see Slash is doing this here. This is a build and the drums are actually following it in this way, in this style with this sort of swing. You know, it was like that kind of stuff I had to start. I had to do with them. So I, and I had never done that before because before that I was just mainly in bands that were allowing me to just do, here's the form, but just mm -hmm. do your thing. And even with Tom Waits, that's sort of how his stuff was. You know what I mean? He never, when we played every night with Tom, every night I probably played every song totally different. Like if you go back and you watch anything on YouTube, you know, each night it was like a different, a, a diff, you know, I'd play it differently depending on how I was feeling. The tempos were different, uh, you know, because a lot of times I just go off of, like, how I'm feeling so the songs will be really fast or too slow. But with Guns, it's like, well, Axel can't sing it if it's this fast or, you know, because it just doesn't make sense and the fans are expecting it to be a certain way. Hmm. Okay, no, that, that makes complete sense. So, um what about with with Bucket? Because I gotta imagine it's kind of the same thing when you when you've worked with with Buckethead that you have that room or things are never the same twice. Because it's so hard to. I mean, you can obviously explain him better than anybody, but just like he's so, it just seems everything seems so meticulous, yet at the same time it's so improv. It's just so improvised. It seems like I just after GNR introduced him to me and also to you as well like i've never seen another guitarist like him where i'm just like is he making that up as he goes along he can't be it sounds like it was written by like mozart or something but it is being translated through you know through his alien self like like so what was it like it was was 
bucket more like Primus or was it more like GNR in preparation or Tom Waits or however you want to compare it? Dude, that's yeah. I mean, dude, that's funny you're asking that because um, it this last tour I did, it got weird for a second, you know, on the road because you know, um, I don't know if you've been following Bucket, but the last what maybe seven years or something, he's been doing playing solo. Yeah, I saw him last year, and I'm looking forward to seeing him this year, either in, in New York City or New Jersey. But yeah, it's just been solo, right. right? Right. It's just been completely solo to take. So when we decided to do this, you know, run of uh, the West Coast, and I think we did, call, yeah, Colorado, Utah. Arizona, and then Seattle, L.A., Sandy, you know, the whole, that, this side of the, um, uh, our, uh, like, for what? I think we did, like, I don't know, like, maybe a month and a half or something. And then and then we did one-offs all the way to the new year or whatever. Like, I think we started in September or something like that. So we did, like, about three months here and there, you know, of playing. And it was, we actually kind of, you know, it got weird for a bit because I think Bucket, I was doing it the way of, oh, here's the song. It's just a form and I'm going to play it my way and it's going to be different every night. And it got weird because he was so used to doing it to the tape and know in the tempo would be exactly the same and his own solo shows mm. that he was having a hard time with it at first. Because he was going, what are you playing? Like, you know, like, that's not the part. And I'd be like, well, I, I didn't learn the part. I just know that this is kind of the feel and this is, but he was so used to it being exactly how his tape was every night. Because, you know, when I looked at his schedule that he has coming up now or whatever, I think someone was saying he was touring. So I was just checking out where he was playing because he's going to do another solo run, it looks like. Mm. Um, it was like, you know, eight shows in a row, one day off, seven shows in a row, one day off, like that Mike Watt type of shit. And um, I was like, you know, like playing every day. And I guess he just gets so used to it that it was, it was weird. Like we had to kind of find a happy medium of where I was going to play, how I was going to play every night because it started to turn into more like, you know, a set thing that he was used to. I don't know if that's what the fans wanted. I know with GNR, that's what they want. You know, when this bill happens at the beginning of November rain, it's got to happen. The right. And it's got to be the same. You can't do some kind of like 30 second note fill when it's, you know, so, but with bucket, he was expecting kind of the, well, Hey, it was this bill that was, I hear every night for the last seven years. So yeah, we thought it was weird. It kind of got weird, I have to say. I can I can understand that from I guess I can understand it, and, and I guess, I don't know if you can answer why you think he he does that. But if you with anything, if you're going to do something uh, repetition, of course that's what you're used to, and especially since it's it's not like he had another drummer coming in playing it the same way. It, it's literally the same tape. And it's literally the same every single time. And you come in and you add that human element. Of course, there's got to be that adjustment period. But since, you know, you guys have gone on tour together, you've obviously been in Guns N' Roses together and you've done a lot, plenty of things. Why do you think he, I don't know, I don't want to say the, the word prefers because that may imply something because I, I don't, obviously I don't know him. But why do you think he goes out just with a, a tape, you know, and he, he might have some, uh, I don't want to call them theatrics because they're so, I just call them 80s horror theatrics. Let's call them that. Uh, why do you think he does that as opposed to maybe taking you out again? Because I don't know about you, Connie, but I'm, I kind of, I don't know, I felt a little disappointed there that that in you not knowing, he's like, I get, well, you saying that, oh, I guess he's going out on tour solo this time. Like, I, I don't know. I feel like I would want you to know that. I don't know. I figure I don't. I, maybe in my head, I'm thinking like Buckethead and Brain or be, best friends. You guys play uh, Parcheesi yeah. every night or something like that. So, and, no, and, I mean, you know, we have our we we you know we we call it the dark periods when we don't talk for a while, and that's just mainly because he's doing his thing and I'm doing mine. You know, like you know, I told you know, like it's it's. I don't think I I would want to do eight shows in a row on the East Coast then a day off and nine shows in a row, you know, some, you know what I mean? Like that many shows. And I think it's easier for him. I think he loves to just go out there and play every night and grind it out and just, 
not even have a day off. I think it's kind of like a weird therapy thing for him, you know. Uh-huh. He just likes to do it that much or whatever. Because I think I think I remember him when we booked the first shows. He had booked our first shows we had ever done in like ten years together. He booked five in a row, like you know, like five. Sh- you know, and I go, dude, I don't think I played five shows in a row ever. Like, <laughs> Brian, Brian, I was fine as we grinded it out at the very beginning, but once the shows start to get to two hours, two and a half hours, three hours, you know, playing a drummer playing five nights in a row. I mean, you know, I'm not flipping 18, no, that's a lot. you know, or that's whatever. And, and I'd like to give up my all on every show. So, um, you know, it's just, I just told him it was kind of hard. He was like, Oh, oh sorry, man. You know, I, I forgot, you know, yeah, I'm bringing a band. So I think it's mainly that he just gets used to doing it himself. Okay. Kind of just goes out there and does it. You know, it's, I don't really feel like it's anything towards because, you know, after the first like four or five shows, he started getting what you exactly talked about was, hey, you know, I'm a human. I'm not going to play it exactly like a metronome perfectly every time. So it is going to waver and my tempo is going to be different because no, nobody wants to go out with the, at the Buckethead show and, and watch a band play to a click and stuff. I get it if he's just playing off tape. You know, of course, it's going to be what it is because it doesn't have the human element except for him. But um, when you bring a band, it's going to waver, and the and I think the audience wants to see a little improv and a little just you know whatever happens. See, that's case, and that's the good shit. You that, know? That's what I want. See, you know, I want to see. I was disappointed last time when. Uh, I think it was when I reached out to you afterwards. That's when you were finished with those dates in Bucket with Bucket, and then he was coming yeah. here by himself. And I would like to yeah, have you seen you play. Be there. Yeah, right, right. Because yeah. I would like to see you play. Because th- this was my first time seeing Buckethead, uh, and it was phenomenal. Yes, it was BB um, King's Blues Club, which is now closed, a famous club here in New York City. Uh, finally got to see Buckethead. Finally got to go there, and it was very cool. You know, I. I I was right up front. It was a wonderful experience, but yeah, the human elements I think would would uh, would add a lot. But you know, if you guys are on different schedules, and I I use sports analogies all the time. I mean, it's like you can't compare a guitarist. I don't know you can say like a guitarist is maybe like a a baseball player and a drummer is like a football player. Not the same schedule. You know what I mean? You know, a fo- yeah. baseball player is going to play almost every day in the week. Football. Maybe twice, maybe twice. If there's a Thursday game, you have more. You need more time to recuperate. So no, that that makes uh, complete sense uh, to me. Uh, Connie, was there anything as far as Tom Waits that he didn't? Because I, I, I'm glad that you sh- uh, shed some more light on that. Because you know you've played with okay. so many different legends. So any other questions uh, regarding Tom or anything that you had for for Brain? Yeah, actually, I have one, which is a pretty old one, referring to something that Axel said. Probably 30 years ago. Okay. <laughs> so, and I think Brain is the man to ask. So, uh, before the Use Your Illusion albums came out, Axel actually said that he has uh, a couple of songs that sound like a cross between Tom Waits and Metallica. And he was probably referring to the November Rain or a Strange. And I, uh, having played with both, Tom Waits and Axel, did you see the, that influence? Hmm. Wow, uh, I never even thought of that. Hmm. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, a weird one, a, I know. <laughs> yeah, um, that's yeah, a that's man a well thought, that, well thought out question. He said, um, "Yeah, man, I don't know. That's a that's a crazy question because I never thought of that. Because with Tom, you know, as far as the song, as far as songwriting, and with." You know, with with on and what you're talking about in that era, you know, I wasn't a part of. You know, I kind of just came in. Yeah, because some like, greats, by the way, you came in, uh, played far less piano, right, on his albums. Yeah, yeah, but but I get the piano thing on. You know, like if you're saying the November Rain and stuff like that. I mean, that's very. You know, I mean, you know, like Tom or you know, Elton John-ish or what, you know, whatever is whatever you want to say, you know, as far as like the, the uh, piano and then having a band backing, you know, uh, the piano. Yeah. But, 
you know, I guess, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I never thought because on those songs, as far as starting the songwriting, um, you know, I wasn't there, you know, with Tom, it's like he has all the songs written. You're very, very rarely improvising. You're definitely improvising the way you, you, you play, but you don't, um, you know, the you don't make it up as you go along. You mean? Yeah, you're not you're not in the room writing with Tom ever. Okay. So Tom comes in with his wife Kathleen, and he's like, "Hey, here's a song. This is a concept. This is kind of you know, I kind of want this kind of like '60s rumba thing <laughs> here. Do you have any ideas? You know that you want to come up yeah. with, or or he'll have like you know he'll bring in like an old cassette or vinyl of some obscure album and be like, is, you know, I'm looking for this kind of sound, like five. And then you kind of listen, you kind of get into the feel of it and that kind of stuff. So I don't know, you know, I can't really answer that. That's a pretty crazy question. I never even thought of that. It's a, it's a, I like that though. I like original questions yeah. that, that make you think. So uh, we definitely know we didn't cover that last episode brain. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I yeah, want. To, I would have remembered that one for sure. And I just want to read you just a bunch of comments again uh, that I got, Brain, because you know your humility is just one of the your your best traits. And just I just want to let you know because you're not on social, not able to read them yet. Uh, Doug from Wisconsin says Brain was part of my second favorite era behind the original lineup. I don't think you hold that against them. I think this era they sounded amazing, and a big part of that was what Brain was on the drums. Uh, Jared from Portland said, I've listened to your brain interview five times. It's rad. It's rad. There you go. Um, <laughs> what's another? Oh, boy. Uh, I, I do want to mention this one because sometimes you, you mean a lot to people. This is stuff from Dan Ludzka. He wants uh, me to relay to you that a friend of his who passed away in 2016, they saw you back in 2002 at the Chicago show together. Uh, they weren't sure about going, but you were one of the reasons why you, they, you made that night very memorable for them. So I just wanted to, to relate well, that right. message. Yeah, okay. that's that's definitely is right. Uh, I, this was like the second request. I, I can only do so much, guys. I can't get you autographs. <laughs> People are like, can you get Brain's autograph? I'm like, A, he's not in studio. B, I, I don't know. I ask for pictures sometimes of many people. Autographs is another thing. But uh, I will relay, because he's a crazy fan, and if you ever get on social media, I'm sure he will find you. I say crazy in a nice way. Uh, Alex Mendoza says, please ask him if you will sign my copy of The Red Hand. Uh, he was recently at, at uh, NAMM, and he got Frank, he got Robin, he has like he even got Duff's signature on The Red Hand. It's crazy. So in return, though, he says he'll take you to, to, to lunch or to Disneyland. Uh, your choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, man. If you want to, if you want to hit me up with some of these people just on the side and let me, you know, and I can contact them my, myself. Yeah, you know, I always joke, and you know, or people like, you know, at the shows or the gun shows or whatever, you know, like, hey, you know, because you know, I don't know if you remember that whole scene in the, um, I think when Sting was doing the, um, you know, when he was doing his first solo tour, and I think Miles Copeland, it's in that Sting movie or whatever. Okay. on the night or something like that i think it's called i don't even remember the name but you know there were there there were the band was complaining about um you know like not getting paid enough or whatever and miles copeland was just like well you know you're if, if sting name name is off the marquee no one shows up if your name is off the marquee everybody still shows up so hey, this is what you're going to get paid and this is what it's about. So I always used to joke with people like, you know, hey, man, I got my five fans out there that are here, you know, and are digging what I'm doing. So I always try to, you know, like, you know, like reach out to those those people because I think that, you know, like you said, those are the two fans that stick with you. Yeah, you got plenty yeah, more than five. I some of that shit. I will definitely reach out to them. Right on, right on. Um, I, I will. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that after. So uh, no, you yeah, definitely, yeah. you definitely have more than five. Uh, I guess uh, this may be <laughs> what you. One of the things that you're working on now, on Twitter, Rain Dogs seventy wants to know, uh, what songs did Brain and Melissa remix for the unreleased Chinese Chinese uh, Democracy Project, and do you think that, you know, you'll be involved in any future projects like that? I don't know if we touched on that last time, but I don't know. Maybe things have developed. I don't, I'm not sure. If you yeah, have... well, you know, we've been we've been we've been kind of just you know as a little. Is it still breaking up? Because it sound is it sound okay? Uh, you sound fine. I think that's uh, that's all the way from Greece. I think that's uh, yeah, probably. I think Connie's eating a gyro. Hey, Connie, you're still there? 
right. so, yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> We're good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we definitely, you know, we definitely even kind of just like, you know, like what we did at the the halftime show, that Houston thing, we've right. been getting a lot of a lot of calls to do that again. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been, yeah, I've been talking to, um, you know, Melissa, because we work on our composing, because we just had that, uh, you know, that movie that came out, Bodied or whatever, that Joseph Kahn film that uh, Eminem produced or whatever. And um, we did the soundtrack to that. And so we're trying to get more work on the soundtrack side. And then we do want to do some touring this year, because I think Guns is off for a little bit. Um, doing that halftime stuff so oh wow Wow. uh, yeah i'm hoping that we can play the remixes because i think we've done maybe like six or seven i think you know of like you know we just kind of like um well we did them a while back and then you know we still have them and they've been remixed two or three different times and we kind of want to add them into the show but you know we'll see if we're allowed to for one um, you know, I mean, Axel was was kind enough to let us do it at the Houston thing and the L.A. one that we did. But, um, you know, that would be great because we want to incorporate that with some of our original music that we're working on now. And, um, yeah, we're hoping to, like, maybe do a run for, like, a couple months, you know, like maybe some festivals or hopefully some more, like, you know, halftime stuff. I mean, you know, the NBA is getting into the um, – their uh playoff schedule so i'm hoping that we can maybe do a couple playoff games again you know do something like that and then maybe go off and do some festivals and stuff like that so that's awesome that's all awesome but you should do uh nhl you know that's coming up they they're uh, starting to get yeah, yeah. NHL, uh are you yeah all of that sounds great i mean i hopefully you get permission but to, to come up with your own material is it going to be known still as brain and melissa or are you gonna was that a working title of the band or uh is there going to be like an actual name or is brain brain and melissa is that just the name of i think it's, i think we're just going to keep brain and melissa and kind of keep it and kind of promote some of our soundtrack stuff also you know kind okay. of like remix that along with like um you know some some um some other you know some of the gun stuff with some original stuff and also almost like a dj type set also you know what i mean like have like two or three different kind of sets we can pull depending on what they are they should have had like, you instead of maroon 5 <laughs> jesus right yeah that uh, the ending kind of took me when he you know, I took off his shirt and showed his tattoos. I was like, that's the death of everything. Right. <laughs> like really? I mean, that's just, it's, I don't know. Well, whatever. I mean, I'm sure he's a great guy and I'm sure it's, but you know, I don't know. It just, it took the, it took the fun out of music for me. <laughs> I was like, really dude? <laughs> it took the fun out of that music. wasn't rad. <laughs> it, it, I, just seems so, it just seems so fake you know what I mean it's just like look at all the tattoos I got and uh, this is horrible <laughs> <laughs> sorry no I think it's hilarious for some reason I'm like I know he's going to take his shirt off because that's what he does he did yeah. it when he hosted SNL yeah. and I'm like I don't know man because I've obviously <laughs> wanted Guns N' Roses to play the halftime show for years and it's like come on I know <laughs> I, I was I was wondering when they're going to get asked because that would just kill. They need to do it. I mean, that would be sick. But to have that and then that's the first time. You, I mean, you, I mean, I mean, it's not the first time. Obviously, you've seen a tattoo in a halftime show. But you know, it's just kind of like, you know, it's like you know, when Iggy Pop takes his shirt off and he looks like a lizard, it's rad. <laughs> but when you're like, you know, when you're just kind of a cheese ball on TV, that I don't know. Sorry, I'm sure he's a great guy. I'm I don't sh- want to say anything bad. I, I'm sure he is too. I mean, he did a song with Slash, so he must have some. Uh, some yeah, he's great. Some, some wonderful qualities. <laughs> uh, one thing I think we 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 did forget last time, and the the show finally leaked. You can only find it now because it'll be hit with copyright by you know copyright uh, Nazis out there. But the the House of Blues show. Which was actually your first show. It's so funny because I think Tommy said the same thing. You, you guys thought the festival was the first show, but I guess House of Blues was the first one. So, and oh, you mean the New Year? Was it the New Year's Eve one? I think. Yeah, that's with, with Paul Tobias. 
Oh, yeah, with Paul. Like Paul didn't put Paul play one show with us. I believe that was it. And no, no, he did. He did. Did he do Rock and Rio? I don't. I mean, there. Are, I mean, even though I host a GNR podcast, there are ones who probably know, but I just don't know off the yeah. top of my head if he did. Because I all I know is that is the first time he, I saw what he looked like when I when I watched that House of Blues show. I had that's no, online now. I gotta check that. It's show. I it's not well that show. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll we'll say maybe or maybe not. I will maybe if I have it, I'll send to you. Legally speaking, I don't know if I have it or not. Whatever, I, I'll send it to you later. Uh, but it's not online, but because again, because right. because of copyright things that are happening. Oh, there is. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is, I mean, fans. This is how crazy fans are, and, and a lot of your material too on Chinese. There are fans, and I'll, I'm going to get to this question from one of the uh, this listener, Rick, who has been on a, a show of mine. We called it. Uh, Copyright democracy. That's what we called it. <laughs> and there's a whole subculture. I mean, I'm sure that in other for other bands or movies or things like that where people buy things of quote unquote, not the black market, but just sell things that really aren't theirs. So there's a lot of, I guess, unreleased material. People say that they're, they were songs supposed to be on Chinese democracy, like The General or Time or things like that. And there are people who buy these or shows. People are buying them, especially since... Brain, I I know again you're not really online yet, but there has been just a huge wave of taking Guns N' Roses material off YouTube, and it's not just people. These are not people trying to make money off Guns N' Roses. These are like fan videos, and it's just it's out of control. But so people want your material to hear it because we don't know if we'll ever get to hear it. Uh, so that's why the House of Blue show was was big. Somebody paid. I think Rick might have paid a, a few grand for it. A few grand for it, and he was nice. Really? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I told him like your your wife doesn't leave you. Uh, uh, good for you. <laughs> I mean, I think that's that's crazy. But he he shared it with me, and yeah, it was my first time seeing Paul. Uh, seeing Axel introduce all of you was just wow. I really think it should be out there. I mean, what an era for Guns N' Roses. I mean, there might have been bitter feelings at that moment in time, uh, but I'd like to think people are matured now and. It's just I think all fans should see that video, not just for again for your work, but that time period, just wow. So uh, Rick wants to know: Do you remember the build up to that House of Blues show? What was it was like? Because Axel had been he hadn't been seen in a while, but before that, yeah. Show. Well, um, I want I want to backtrack for a second. Sure, we're talking about Tommy and and you just mentioned the song The General, and it kind of. It's funny because I, I have a story because I'm, you know, this this album that um, I'm making right now with some old friends, you know, we just decided to kind of, you know, it, it ended, it started as a, you know, bowling night out type thing where we had, where I have a friend that has his rad studio in um, Berkeley. And he was like, you know, hey, Brian, I'm taking off to Mexico or something for a couple months working on this project. You can just have the studio and come in and jam and do stuff. So, you know, I called up uh, my friend Merv, um, who was, you know, part of the Limbo Maniacs and um, with me and stuff like that. And this, this, um, and my friend Extract, who's kind of like a DJ, worked on this uh, L Stu album that Bucket actually played on also, along with like, this DJ Eddie Daff and uh, DJ Disc and uh, and then Bucket was on it and stuff. So it's funny because how the general came about was we were supposed to, you know, this was like building up to that show. We were supposed to, um, or not supposed to, but, you know, everybody was like, hey, if anybody's got songs and shit, you know, you can bring them in. And so... Uh, that song, The General, was a song that, um, you know, we like uh, Extract and Merv and, and I, when we when I wasn't doing gun stuff, would just, you know, like jam in my, my living room type of thing. You know, I had like a Pro Tool set up and we were jamming and we were trying to come up with songs for um, gun. And, um, you know, we had this song called... Um, well, we called it the general because we were we were eating general's chicken. Okay. Chinese chicken. <laughs> but when I turned it in to Axel, he thought it was called the general because 
I was kind of making fun of Tommy as Tommy was the band, you know, kind of like the MD. He was like the music, you know, the band, musical director when we'd have rehearsals. And he thought like, you know, I was like poking fun at Tommy as being like, you know, like a general, like, you know, like, okay, we're rehearsing at this time. And, you know, and that kind of shit. And I was like, no, dude, it was because we ate general's chicken. <laughs> I don't know. If you got it, but yeah. So it's funny because you just said the general and it, it all comes back around because, you know, we were writing all these crazy songs to try to turn in, um, to, you know, and, and these were coming from like, you know, like extract is an old school DJ type, uh, you know, he's a bass player, but he loves old school break beats and, you know, crate digger type of guy. And so the, the shit we were putting together was crazy. You know, we were just, we were just kind of going like, okay, you know, like well, what samples should we find for Axel? Like, well, he's kind of like Julius Caesar. So we were like sampling Julius Caesar, like looking for albums that, you know, and old school crazy shit. And I think we sampled like Ben Hur and chopped it up and cut it up. And that, be- I don't know if that was, you know, that became a jam called seven. I think we called it seven. Okay. And then, you know, and I remember bringing them to, um, you know, the studio to have, I think Roy Thomas Baker was producing at that point. And, um, you know, and he was, we would be playing the stuff and he'd be in, you know, like one of the songs that actually is called the album that we're making now is called Mars Mechanics. And um, one of the songs we have on the album, we put that one on the album and it was one of the ones that I played for Roy and you know, he, he, he was like, what is this, reggae? You know, we were, and I was just like, no, because it was like a Neil Young old school jam that, you know, Merv was just going off on. But the whole thing was just like, you know, I was turning in all these like weirdo songs that were coming, you know, like way far to the left or whatever. And, you know, it was just kind of a crazy story of how that's one of them was the general. And I think Axel actually sang on the general. I mean, that's just, that's too funny because, again, years of people just speculating, you know, what songs may be on Chinese democracy and then now what may come out in a, in a future Guns N' Roses record. Are they going to be reworked tunes from the Chinese era or are they going to be new things that maybe Slash and Duff bring in, a combination? So all these names are, have been out there for a while it's just so cool to find out, you know, a little part of the story uh, that it could be a serious thing, and it's about chicken. I just think that just makes it so Guns N' Roses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty funny. We ordered General's Chicken that night, and that's how the song "The General" came about. So it's pretty good. So what about the um, the build up to House of Blues? Do you, do you remember that? Because it was like professionally recorded. But it was obviously never released. So do you, what was the mindset going into that? Did you, I'm assuming that was the plan to release it at some point, you know, to introduce the world? No, I don't, I mean, they, they, you know, we, it was, it was more, I think at that point, you know, hey, you know, here, here's like, you know, six people that have never played together that have all been in awesome bands and done, you know, has a history and, everyone in themselves have, has a history and now they're all together, kind of like a super group type of vibe. And I don't think, you know, any, nobody, I don't think we, anybody was thinking about it. I think we were just thinking like, Oh shit, here's a catalog of, you know, these 40 songs we got to learn. And, you know, gotta, we gotta kill it. We gotta, you know, like get this shit down. So we we're just kind of like in that kind of work mode for like three months. So when that show happened, I remember it just felt like a dream. It was just like, shit, now we're on stage and we're playing. I don't, you know, it wasn't like, we didn't know what to expect ourselves because, you know, that that was it. It was like, you know, usually bands, you know, you get, you know, start by just your friends hanging out, talking shit, you know, in high school, you start a band, you start touring, you, you, you develop the sound and who you are, like, on the road in a van stepping on each other's heads and just, you know, like (laughs) doing crazy shit, you know, and just 
then it becomes a sound and then that sound, you know, you develop that and then blah, blah, blah. But with this, it was more like, you know, when, when I got done, I remember just going, shit, did we pull it off? What, what do people think? Like what happened? Because it was like, here's like the biggest band that was the biggest band in the world. Here we are do, you know, we're, we're coming out and I don't know, even know what we thought we were supposed to expect. If that makes sense, you know, because it wasn't like choreographed either. Like you're just, you know, you're playing for like Janet Jackson, <laughs> right, sure. you know, like here, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I do you know, playing the songs and people are expecting just, you know, it was like, well, they want to hear a band. I mean, you're replacing some of the cuff and flash, you know what I mean? It's like, wait a second. So, you know, I don't know what the audience was th- thought, but, the way I was feeling was just like, whoa, what the, I remember getting done, you know, finishing the show and walking, going back into the elevator and going up and just being like, wait, did we just play? Like, it felt like it was just like a dream. I don't think you, I mean, uh, you couldn't have explained it any better to me. I don't know about you, Connie, but I, when I watched it, that was awesome. (laughs) I I felt like I was watching a dream because it was a lost era of Guns N' Roses, and just to see, again, how professionally it done it was and how good it was. Because I know for a little while, I think it was, uh, you know, I don't really consider the, the new GNR, what, what, however you want to phrase it, controversial anymore, because Chinese democracy, I th- but for the most part, people, even people who try to hate it, they're like, oh, well, it was still pretty good. Like, it's a good record. It's a great record. And it's just so funny because it could be it could have been such an easy target because Axel was such a target, but he, he's continually proved people wrong. And that video is just another example of him proving people wrong that he got the right players. And just to see, you know, your look, and then Buckethead and Robin Fink being an alien, and then Paul looking just like a regular guy, and then you know, there's a lost version of Axel I don't remember seeing. It, it's just really special and. All the players on that record and that era just deserve, you know, this is why you have fans, Brain. I mean, in addition to everything else you've done, but in, you know, you brought in more fans uh, through GNR because of the contributions. You can say, yeah, oh, you're replacing with so-and-so. But I, I don't know how you all pulled it off. I mean, in, in my view, you guys were, it, it just worked. Uh, to me, it was like being um, a sports fan, a Yankee fan. I love the Yankees that I grew up with, remembering those players. But I, I still love the Yankees now. It's all about the jersey. It's all about the players. I mean, all about the team. Yeah. Th- that's cool. I appreciate you, know you sharing crazy? that that experience. Yeah. You know what's crazy that I wanted to add to that really quick was that since that was the first show and that's what it felt like, it was just like, I think everybody was just like, whoa, what the fuck happened? Um and then, you know, then we, we, I think then we did Rock and Reel. And right. It was at a point that also felt like a dream. I think everybody would probably say the same thing. Um, it wasn't until I think, and I might have mentioned this before, I mean, Kai would ha- have to tell me if I had mentioned this before, but um, it wasn't until after the Madison, I think at Madison Square Garden, that show, I think that's where it felt like, whoa, I feel like this is a band for, you know, like Bucket let, uh, I mean, um, Axel at Bucket and I, we were like kind of doing our own thing. Like at one point, you know, we would start, we started like doing a little improv in the middle and that was expanding and everything was happening. And then that was the unfortunate, you know, thing that happened where the next day we were in Philly at the spectrum. And, um, you know, that's when um, they canceled the whole tour. And it was, it was, I think everybody, cause that, but, but at that point, I remember even talking to Bucket and everybody, buddy and Mother Goose, and we were all just kind of hanging out and we were kind of like, shit, I, that kind of, you know, it's working. Like, you know, this is kind of cool. Like that was a cool show we just played and it felt like it was becoming a band and it, you know, and it was just sad to me at that point because I was like, oh, we never got to really take off. And then from there, that's after and Bucket left. Then, you know, it became something else. And then, it, you know what I mean? Sure. It's like, I think for any real band to gel and become something, you really got to get out on the road, play a bunch of shows, grind it out, start, you know, really feeling each other, 
you know, and how they play and, and how it works, you know, but it, but, um, what reason but were you given? Was Cause I was, I was at that. that was my first show, that MSG show. And that's why right. I, I became a fan of bucket forever and brain forever. And, and, and that, that part, I mean, that was my, I didn't know if I would ever see Axl Rose live. Never thought, of course, I would ever see Axl and Slash on stage together, but that MSG show will forever hold a place in my heart. Um, and then just to see it, I mean, at the time, I was like, wow, I may have seen the last Guns N' Roses show ever because everything got, you know, ended. But uh, well, it, it's, it, it's... How it, wrong were you? Yeah. Uh, so how, like, what, how was it relayed to the band? Like, was, it, was there a certain explanation? Like, you know, what you can talk about, what you're comfortable with? Um, I think, it, well, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was confusing to everybody because we all thought everything was cool. And I think that it was Clear Channel's decision. That's what I was told, that they were just like, oh, we're having problems with some of the scheduling or something like that. And of upcoming shows, and we booked too many, and, you know, I, don't, I think Axel wasn't happy with that or something. And then, you know, some, something happened between them, and they pulled the plug. I think, you know, I don't think it was anybody in the band. I mean, oh. I don't know what everybody else was told, but... You know, to me, I heard what they told me is Clear Channel is pulling the plug and everybody's going home tomorrow. <sighs> and mm. I was like, okay, whatever. That's interesting. But um, I feel like that's a different narrative than what's been out there because you know what the um, what's been said about Axel. I mean, now it's the, the narrative has changed because he's early, if anything, on time. But you know, <laughs> how long is this going to last? How long until they cancel? And people always blame it on on him and it, this yeah, seems to be another case where it wasn't yeah. him yeah i mean i think that's where you know i mean like i said every time i do an interview he's always been cool to me and i always see it as you know like yeah of course point the finger to axel because you know i mean without axel there's nothing so you know obviously he's the easy one to say if something fucks up you know but there's so many things going on. I mean, it was such mm -hmm. a big production. You know what I mean? That, But what they told me was they were just like, hey, Clear Channel's pulling the plug. So Interesting. I was like, oh, shit, okay. Well, I guess that's it. You mentioned uh, also Mother Goose. Uh, uh, another listener from, of ours, uh, Jan from Germany, wants to know if you still talk to Chris Pittman, because I know he had an unceremonious exit, but uh, do you guys still uh, keep in touch? You know, I haven't talked to him in a while. I haven't talked to him since I think around that incident happened. And, um, you know, I want to reach out. I mean, he, you know, like that was part of the fun. I mean, Goose is, you know, became one of my be uh, best friends in that, that whole time during that time. And, you know, it the one of the buses was Bucket, Goose, and me. That was like, three people on the bus and that was our road show going down you know following the other buses and stuff and we you know fly on that wall <laughs> yeah you know we had a we had a great time so you know i mean actually you know even talking about it now you know i think yeah i'll probably reach out to him actually you know like over the weekend or something i cool. really do want to talk to him we just kind of you know everybody kind of just starts doing their own thing and starts going i mean i hope there's no animosity or whatever because of you know, actually who took over, but, you know, um, I think that we should be cool. I hope so, but I'm going to reach out. Cool. Well, um, I, I will say that because I've said to other guests of mine, I think the, the cool thing that I'm able to do with the podcast, for example, I interviewed Roberta Freeman, and then when I had her on again, she was my co-host, and we interviewed Teddy Zigzag. So I could say right. to you, if, you know, if everything's cool with Chris and you want to play co-host for the day and add another you know, a title to your long list of accomplishments and in, in, in your resume. If you want to add a radio show host to it, you could be my co-host <laughs> and we can interview Mother Goose together. Just a thought. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. I don't know if anybody wants to hear Rad that many more times. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. <laughs> and, I mean, it's either that or, I mean... You know, obviously, this is uh, this is up there with the impossibility of, of interviewing uh, Axel. But then again, this show wouldn't be as fun, as much fun to do if all these people were uh, super accessible. Uh, but Buckethead, I mean, I, I interviewed, I mean, I listened to his interview with his therapist, 
which I thought was really cool because I go to therapy and I'm big into mental health. I tried to reach out. I did reach out to his therapist to see if I can interview them, not to get anything like personal, but just to talk about the, I don't know, like what I do, talk about depression, mental health, uh, how that revolves in and out of the rock world. You know, nothing specific on Bucket. Uh, you're, again, the, the closest thing that I got to uh, to Mr. I almost called him Mr. Head. I think that's too weird. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just any, any I, I doubt that you can get Buckethead on the show. But if in, in the future, because I want you to come back uh, whenever you want, because you're you are rad, man. Uh, <laughs> and, and to keep us, because I know I don't want to keep you here forever. Because I know we've been talking for an hour, and you know that's what's so funny. You're like I, we, I spoke for so long. You just said it. Who wants to keep hearing rad? I mean, uh, Connie, you're probably the same way. I'm just sitting here like, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> like really, exactly wow. the same. <laughs> Speechless. Yeah, because <laughs> the word. And not all guests are like that. You know, I've enjoyed every single one of my guests for the most part. I mean, some have, I just don't want to cut them off when they're in a long story, but it, it doesn't have me like you got me, where I'm just really entrenched into what you're saying. So, Connie, if you have any other questions, but I want to talk about, you know, Brain's new stuff. But, uh, Connie, if you have any questions, I guess we should uh, get to that uh, first. Uh, just a small one. Uh, Tom Waits, again. Uh, you were in the Bone Machine album, and uh, Keith Richards was there. Did you get to jam with him? No, man, I wish. I mean, you know, like I said, like those those two, yeah, those two together, yeah, that would have been great. No, they were, I think he did that on a separate time just with Keith. I'm not even sure if Keith came to the studio we were working in. You know, I wasn't even sure because with Tom, I think when we did Bone Machine, like, um, is that the one with Big in Japan on it? No, I think that's a uh, meal variations. Meal variations. Okay. So bone and bone machine was first. Was that before meal variations? Yeah, yeah, the, the first one. Yeah, it was, right? You're in. That album yeah. came before. Yeah. So right. So yeah, cuz the one we did with Primus, I remember what studio we were. I think both were recorded in the same studio. Only Real Gone was the one where we went to that uh old church, I think. So, yeah, no, I wasn't there, man, but that's, I mean, I wish that would have been a dream come true, you know. For I mean, anyone, I, right? Those two together, I mean, you know, I, I watched that Keith Richards documentary, and, you know, I saw Tom in there doing a song with him, and I was like, oh, man, you know, with Steve Jordan, and, oh, God, it was so cool. I wish I yeah. could, uh, you know, because Steve Jordan's one of my heroes, so, man, that would have been sick. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you cool. never know. Keith is still with us, so... You just never know. He, he may, He's like a cockroach, right? That's the only thing that survives in a nuclear holocaust. It Keith, is uh, Keith Richards and a cockroach or cockroaches? That was my terrible joke. <laughs> uh, so let us know. Right. I mean, because you, you gave us, um, I guess, a look into the future, what may happen with Melissa. Hopefully you'll get some, you'll, you'll get the approval to play GNR remixes, but at least you'll be working on or continue to work on new material and hopefully a tour which would be amazing. I hope you make it out to the East Coast. Uh, hopefully you make it out to Greece as well. Don't want to forget you, Connie. Yeah. <laughs> but that might be more more planning involved in that one. Uh, so what else do you have going on? We, we want to know. We want to know how to keep track and, and, and just watch what Brain has coming out in the future. Yeah, like I said, I was working. I kind of got into it um, you know, with uh, uh, earlier because of the story, because it kind of related Um you know, because uh, uh, um, with this Mars mechanic thing that I'm doing with uh, uh, Merv and Extract, and uh, Eddie Def is on it, and um, you know, it, it came from the El Stu era with with when Bucket was in it, but and that was a you know a while back when we were, um, I think uh, I don't even remember the record label we were on, but this was like I think even pre Primus, but yeah, you know, we're just putting out this album. You know, and it's funny, like I said, because the actual title song, Mars Mechanics, was one of the songs I turned in an outtake from uh, the, some of the songs we were writing for GNR. Because, you know, it's like oh. at that point, I've always been kind of a collaborator. You know, I like to like get together, you know, so when they, you know, I'm not just like sit around and yeah, of course, I make make some of my own music and do some of my own shit. But mainly you know i like collaborating with people so you know it was like that's why like this melissa thing you know it's like i think we work well together so um you know i'm doing that thing with her and then for this project i thought oh man you know 
extract and I have been talking about doing something for a long time. We thought, hey, let's bring in Merv. And hey, remember we were writing back in the day, so we've been digging up all our old like discs and stuff. You know, like I mean, literally like floppy discs and shit <laughs> and stuff we had, and like you know, like old like weird Macs and wow. weird computer stuff, and plugging them in and listening to the cool, you know, some of the stuff and all this GNR stuff came up that we, that I was submitting. And so we, you know, and, you know, so we've just been revamping some of those, you know, some were just so out that I just, you know, it's ridiculous. I'm just like, I can't even believe I turn this into Roy or whoever was listening. I don't know, maybe even Axel heard of it. I mean, you'll hear some of them on the album Cool, you know, and they're crazy. Like one is called Cozy, I think. Because of uh, Pete Cozy, he was the guitar player. I think he passed away, but he was with Miles Davis in the 70s. Oh. And uh, he was always one of my uh, favorite guitar players. Um, yeah, if you don't know, you should listen to that era, like the Dark Magus and oh, um, Get Up With It era of that. I think Cozy's on some of those albums. And, um, I mean, it was just, I, I can't even, if I turn that in, it, it, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and, and the fans, if they ever check it out, you know, online, Christmas and click on Cozy, they would go, yeah, brain's fucked up. I wouldn't have turned that in either. It's, it's not even cool, really. Well, I'm looking forward but, uh, to, to know, hearing it's, what it's it... All weirdo, yeah, it's all the weirdo shit. I, this might not even be right for GNR fans, but it's all the weirdo shit. Hey, I mean, again, it, I love Bucket, and he's the weirdo <laughs> shit. I mean, it's just... I, we appreciate yeah. it. Primus, I love Primus. Primus is weirdo shit. I'm a weirdo. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, you might, you know, we wanted to get Bucket on this, but it just never, we never could connect, and okay. it never happened because he was a part of it, you know, before too. But you know, we got Merv on it, so that that's cool. When do you that's th- pretty much what I'm working on besides the tennis. And well, when do you think we can we can expect that that uh, that record? <laughs> Uh, the Mars, that's ready to go. We're just trying to see if someone wants to put it out. If not, we're going to probably just put it out ourselves. So I'm thinking okay. it's like the next mo- month. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, we, have out to a, we have it out cool. to a couple of labels, and they're checking it out and um, seeing if we can work something out. Not that we're going to get any money, but it would be cool to just have it out on something. So Right on. Uh, and if not, we'll put it out ourselves. So Awesome. Looking forward to, to that, Well, however it comes out. And then, yeah, the, the tennis thing. I mean, are you looking, like, is this going to be a, a career change for you? <laughs> or is this just, you know, you're, you're challenging yourself. Like, you like playing tennis, but you know what? I want to see how far I could take this. You know, is this like a uh, yeah. a Tim Tebow trying uh, leaving football, trying baseball? Like, what, what do you, what do you, or is this, what, what's, a, what's a better analogy of a, of like, of like one person jumping from one, I don't know, like Master P trying to play basketball. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably about it's it's probably on that level or, or worse. But um <laughs> no, I mean yeah, I mean for one, yeah, I'm just in, enjoying it right now. But I mean I would love to compete. Like I had like I said, my first tournament was last night, you know, doing a USTA um tournament and you know, it was awesome. I mean, it was like I want to do more and, and this team I'm on it, uh, has been doing really well. And, um, you know, they might go to like districts and then they then from there they go to, I think, um, you know, the regionals and stuff like that. So I'd like to see how far I can take it. But like I said, my goal is I want to, I'm taking crazy lessons and I'm like doing it like five days a week. I mean, I would love to like be able to, um, you know, like challenge Lars to a match or something. I mean, that would be my <laughs> ultimate goal. I mean, I've only met him a couple of times, but... You know, I, I, but his dad was like, I think his dad was a pro. You know, I mean, I think his dad like played yes, one He was. Think, was a professional yeah. player. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Like, and I heard Lars is good too. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. That might just be way out. But. I don't know. I yeah, think... but he went the other way. He quit uh, tennis to take up drums. Oh, that's what Lars right. did? Yeah. <laughs> All wow. Right. Okay. Exactly the opposite. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't know that. Interesting. I, I guess that's a good career move. I can't imagine him being more yeah. famous and wealthy. <laughs> Worked out for him, I guess. <laughs> so let's yeah, let's uh, let's let's keep practicing. Obviously, you're you're on the right path, uh, and and maybe 
you know, it'll be uh, Lars versus Brain in the halftime, or I don't, what do they call it in tennis? Just like mid match, it'll be uh, Brain and Melissa. So you'll you'll do the halftime <laughs> thing yeah, there. Yeah, right. <laughs> it'll be a whole it'll be a whole thing for you. No, that, that's that's completely awesome, Brain. I mean, this is all good. I know you said uh, you know you were gracious enough to come back on, but you're like, oh, I actually have things to talk about now. Well, we, you always have things to talk about, but the fact that we got to look forward to the things from you for, with Melissa, uh, with Merv, uh, you know, tennis <laughs> even is just is super cool. And then hopefully social media, because obviously you have a lot more than five fans. So uh, hopefully we see you on Twitter or get Instagram. Instagram seems to be what all the cool kids are doing now. Um, and and hopefully this will be the start of uh, rekindling your friendship with uh, with Mother Goose. Hopefully the, something comes from yeah, that man. as well. I, 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 I hopefully it will, man. I miss I, I miss him. Right on. Well, uh, Tommy misses you, so uh, he definitely. I, as I played earlier, he got a kick. I miss Tommy also. Yeah. Right on. Who knows? Maybe one day we'll have like a whole uh, Chinese reunion here on the AFD show. Maybe we'll pull that off one day. <laughs> I don't know if I can ha- make that happen. Uh, Connie, anything else before we let uh, Brain continue his day? No, it, just to say it's been an honor, dude. Oh, thanks, Tommy. I mean, thanks, thanks. You know, thanks so much. No, thank you, yeah. man. So, uh, Brain, I, again, it's just really appreciated. You. Obviously, you're always welcome on. One more sound effect for you. You are a. I call my. That's why I call my listeners here. And they call them bad apples. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm a weirdo. That's why I, I like you, Brain. I'm a weirdo as well. Wait, have you even has Melissa done this? She has not. I mean, I, I was just talking to her yesterday when i said i was doing this and i was like hey have you done it yet and she was like no and i was like well you should you know i mean it's it's rad and you know here i sent her the link <laughs> what i'm not gonna start using rad dude now you're making me <laughs> <laughs> fucking mojo that's what i said to connie before I, I, yeah man it's, it's a sick podcast and uh um you know like you should check it so she said, "Yeah, get get uh, give him my um, email." I yeah. appreciate that that you did that. So yeah, no, please uh, send me her email. I would love to. You know, believe that's... me, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have recommended you if I didn't think it was you know like uh, worth doing, and it was you know like how cool how cool you were. And thank you, let me kind you. And um, um, you know, so yeah, I mean, I, I I was telling her, yeah, you know, it's it's it's. <laughs> See, now I was about to say rad. Dude. This me up. I, I said to Connie yeah, I before. I think I'm messed up. Now I got to go see a therapist over rat. I said, I was like, Connie, I was like, he's going to be self conscious. I know it now. I, I, I love yeah, it. Now, yeah, I was like thinking too much. But um, <laughs> all right, well, cool. I mean, I'll definitely hit her up. She's a perfect person. You, you know. You, you'll see it'll it'll, it'll be cool. we can just talk about candy the entire time you know what i mean right that's it, her vibe yeah exactly i just think <laughs> you guys would i just know you and the questions you're gonna ask and the way she is that uh you're gonna love it and you are you know well even she'll know she'll she'll tell you she can't talk about something sure but, you know i would ask some crazy shit why not <laughs> <laughs> well even if it works even if it doesn't work out brain I, I appreciate you just even doing that and saying that so uh you know the the effort and the thought is uh means a lot so so thank you that's rad <laughs> you got now here's what you do you got to make the uh, brain rad t-shirts before social media <laughs> you got to sell those and, uh, on, on your just, website dude, it's just- it just comes out now. Now I'm thinking about it. I gotta. I'm gonna. I might have to flip it. I'm sorry. Today. I'm, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. We'll think of another word. Tubular. Say yeah. tubular. Say tubular more. <laughs> Groovy. Oh, uh, well, brain. Thank you so much for your time. You yeah, were man. just totally awesome. And I, I hope to just you know one day you you come out here to the East Coast, whether it's with Melissa or or how, however it is. I would love to meet you and just you know shake your hand and just make it awkward. Yeah. We well we and. And Connie, we've been getting some weird offers playing some crazy places. So we might be we might be hitting really? three sooner than we think. Oh yeah. Yeah, we've been getting some oh, offers. That would be from, cool, uh, man. Right on. Yeah, uh, but let's talk to more you. about that. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I look forward to it all, cool. Brian. Thank you so much. And you right enjoy- on, man. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest Thanks, of your day. Man. Bye, bye. Bye. All right. Enjoy Later. your day, man. Yeah, you too, dude. Bye.